This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania. I'm your host, Dr. Roy Anong, speaking to you from the University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. Barrett Christie, Director of Husbandry at the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk, Connecticut, has worked with most major groups of aquatic animals, from seals to sharks to corals. But, ironically, he has a strong passion for the desert. Desert fishes, that is. Join us as Barrett explains why and why some of these fishes are in trouble. We'll be right back after these messages. Hey, cat people. Litter box smells always on your mind. Think about your cat, not the box, with World's Best Cat Litter, the litter that delivers big odor control in a tiny package. World's Best Cat Litter harnesses the concentrated power of corn to trap odors deep inside the litter. Ready to knock out smells and use less litter? Find World's Best Cat Litter at Target, Walmart, and in your local grocery and pet stores. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Barrett Christie, Director of Animal Husbandry at the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk, Connecticut. Barrett, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. So, yeah, I've, I've kind of spoken with you a little bit, done a little bit of uh, sleuthing online, and, and you, you definitely have a pretty wide breadth and scope of uh, animals you've worked with, and you've been at a number of uh, aquaria. We're, before we kind of get into the desert fishes, which mm-hmm. is going to be the topic of this interview, I wanted to kind of get a little bit of background, personal info. Um, nothing too personal, though, so hopefully um, you'll be okay. So how did you get interested in aquatic life at first, and what kind of influenced you? You know, I grew up as a kid in the 1980s, and Jacques Cousteau's presence was, you know, kind of an influence in a lot of us that went into marine biology in the 1990s. Uh, that's certainly undeniable. But I think the driving force for me, honestly, was Shark Week on the Discovery Channel when I was a kid. That was the... Uh, opened up my eyes, and a, and a lot of my colleagues have similar experiences, really opened up my eyes to how awesome marine life was and, and led me to eventually want to pursue a career studying it. Now, did you have aquariums growing up? And if so, how did you get involved in, in uh, the hobby? You know, I was never really a dedicated hobbyist until I was actually working in a public aquarium. My little brother growing up had aquariums. He was big into the hobby, uh, lots of planted tanks and, and whatnot in his room. I was big into fishing as a kid. I would keep crayfish and I was more of a naturalist. I, I enjoyed seeing what I could find down in the local creek or when we went to the beach. Uh, and it wasn't until I had actually gotten my first job as a public aquarist that I felt like I needed to kind of broaden my knowledge uh, because I never kept saltwater at home. So I started keeping tanks at home as an aquarist while I was in college. And, you know, that quickly grew from a small obsession of one small reef tank to, you know, a dozen tanks or more. And it completely took over the apartment. Were you from Texas originally or where were you from? I grew up all over the country. Um, My parents worked. My father was a military contractor. So we we moved around a little bit. Spent a lot of time in upstate New York, a fair amount of time in, in Texas, but also Southern California, South Carolina, Virginia. But always near the beach. One of my first memories, oddly enough, uh, is touching a starfish at the Birch Aquarium, Scripps Institute for Oceanography, when I was a kid. So we were always near the water and always connected to the water in some way, shape, or form. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like you definitely had been all over. Now, you mentioned your first aquarium was a, a reef tank. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I set up a, uh, I started working as an aquarist and I felt like my knowledge in saltwater was a little lacking. So I dove right into the hobby as a 20 year old kid and set up a little 20 long, a uh, little nano reef in my apartment and kept, you know, the easiest, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got from a, another friend who's a curator at another facility now who was a big reef geek. I asked him, you know, what corals should I start with? And he looked at me very deadpan and said, start with a book. So I did. I started with a book and then ended up with, you know, a lot of the Corallomorphins, nothing too extreme, but it got me that experience that I wanted and it definitely got me hooked. So you ended up with your first job at Moody Gardens. I I guess had you all along decided that you were going to, what you wanted to work in an aquarium and how did you get that job? 
You know, the, the jobs in our field are really, really competitive in public aquariums. Um, I'm hiring for an aquarist right now, and I've got over 70 resumes. Uh, it seems like it's getting more competitive, so they're difficult to get, uh, especially in Galveston, Texas. There's a there's a great school on the island. Texas A&M University is there, and there's 1,500 marine biology students, so the competition was even more fierce for, you know, the two or three part-time positions that might be available at the local aquarium. But I got started through volunteering as many places as I could. And I worked in education and was persistent and didn't get discouraged when I got turned down time and time again. And after probably about the 14th interview, I finally landed a, a part-time position. Yeah, I, know, I mean, I know a lot of people that definitely want to work in an aquarium. And I, I can kind of see what you're talking about just uh, with, with people not being disappointed and kind of having to go for it. So that's awesome. Perseverance. <laughs> It pays to be persistent and it pays to, uh, pays to volunteer and intern. So because you have been all over the place, both in terms of uh, life and a lot of really cool aquaria you, you have worked at, I, I was going to kind of ask for a quick highlight reel. So uh, can you tell me one of your favorite memories from, I guess if you had one at Moody Gardens, but also Dallas Aquarium and Odyssey Aquarium in Arizona? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, there's so many. The great thing about this job is that you love every single day that you come to work. You'll never get rich doing it. And there's a thousand things I could pick from. If I had to pick one, you know, being on the coast of Moody Gardens, uh, being able to collect collect sharks and get paid to go shark fishing is one of the best jobs you can possibly have. In Dallas, what I really appreciated about Dallas, uh, I worked at the Dallas Aquarium at Fair Park, which is not to be confused with the Dallas World Aquarium. That's an 80-year-old facility. And I was really struck by the sense of history working there. You know, this aquarium has been around since 1936. There are generations of really talented fish keepers who came before me and really built a legacy. And when the place opened in 36, there weren't a lot of public aquariums in the country. And certainly even the hobby was not as nearly as big as it is now. So these guys really laid the foundation. Uh, I felt a real sense of pride working there because these guys that came before me laid the foundation for what we now know as animal husbandry and what we know as fish keeping. They developed a lot of these techniques. But for me, the highlight was definitely getting to renovate it. The place was falling apart when I got there and getting to gut the building from scratch, modernize everything, the life support, the filtration, and really bring the aquarium into the 21st century was, was definitely the highlight for me. And at Odyssey, I went on from there. I got the opportunity to open a, a massive, nearly 2 million gallon aquarium out in the desert. And the highlight there was, was being able to build a place from the ground up. I mean, from absolute scratch. And we did it very quickly. We brought in uh, over 30,000 animals in a very short time frame, uh, hired a very talented team, uh, and just got to work with, with wildlife from all over the world, saltwater, freshwater, uh, Indo-Pacific, Caribbean, fresh, you know, just a, a huge variety of wildlife. That was definitely the coolest part for me. Well, I did have the opportunity to visit Odyssey, uh, I think a year ago or so, and it was, yeah, pretty amazing, definitely having all that aquatic life in the desert. We'll talk yeah. a little bit more about that. But but uh, I, I also heard, and I think you kind of mentioned previously, uh, one of your other little adventures at Dallas Aquarium, the peanut butter right. event. Why don't you tell us about that? So we we had kind of had this joke for years that we should we should feed peanut butter to jellyfish and it would make them peanut butter and jellyfish, you know, a great pun. And then we started thinking about it and we were doing some research. I was looking at alternate food sources to reformulate our gel diets. And I found a lot of of papers uh, suggesting peanut meal could be replaced as a substitute for fish meal in these food sources. You know, the gel diets that we use in aquarium are very similar to the way flake food and pellet food is made. It's kind of a, a mixture of shrimp meal, fish meal, binders, a little bit of everything goes into it. So this really intrigued me. So we tried it. We, uh, we fed peanut butter. We emulsified it with a blender and just fed peanut butter to little moon jellies. And surprisingly enough, they grew and they thrived and got to the point where they were actually reproducing. So it was, it was really funny for us to say, hey, wow, this, not only did this work, but there was enough protein in peanut butter for these jellyfish to grow and to thrive and to grow at a natural, healthy rate, which was hilarious. So we wrote it up as kind of a half-hearted joke, but kind of a, hey, look at this and a an aquarium journal. And, you know, next thing I know, National Geographic's calling me because it went viral on the internet. That's amazing. So has this not yet become a uh, standard of practice? Hasn't become a standard practice <laughs> yet. It really, really fouls the water. Ah, okay. <laughs> I ended up moving on to Odyssey not long after that. So I haven't had a chance to do a lot of follow-up trials, but I'd be willing to bet there is an application for peanut protein to replace some of the fish and the shrimp proteins in a lot of the foods we feed to our animals. Yeah, no, I mean, that seems to definitely support that. So that, no, that's cool. So now, um, 
You are in Connecticut now. What made you decide to move from Arizona to Connecticut? You know, the defining factor for me as a, as a marine biologist and somebody who works with fish, especially a lot of marine fish, is that I had been landlocked for about 12 years at that point. I moved away from the coast. Uh, I was in Dallas for 10 years uh, at Odyssey for almost two. Uh, and the opportunity came to move to an aquarium on the coast, which was enticing. Uh, it was a smaller aquarium, but a, a really interesting collection focused on the Long Island Sound. When I go somewhere, I've seen a lot of aquariums. So when I go somewhere, I'm always more interested in the little aquarium that really focuses on the local habitat. That to me is is oftentimes more interesting than seeing the same types of, you know, they may be gorgeous, but the same types of reef tanks and, and fish displays that I've seen in other facilities. I like seeing something new and something focused on the local habitat because ultimately that's what we're here to do is educate that next generation of kids and inspire them to care about their local habitats and inspire them to be a force for change in the world. And of course, it didn't hurt the fact that this facility happens to have an amazing conservation research program. Uh, we have scientists on staff and we have our own 68-foot hybrid electric research vessel, which is kind of the icing on the cake. Well, that kind of segues really well into uh, desert fishes. You know, uh, obviously, these would be kind of local for us and, and also um, kind of bringing to attention some of the issues involved with that. And I, I kind of agree with you. I really do like the aquariums that are not it's kind of almost like craft beer i guess you know if you think about it sort of yeah, <laughs> yeah you know you, you can get the same types of beer all over the place but the ones that are really unique to a specific area are kind of the ones that you really enjoy a little bit more i think right so, it's more so of a farm to table approach in fish keeping exactly so yeah so let's move on to uh desert fishes now you, you know as we alluded to earlier you've definitely done a lot of work in with a lot of different species of animals been all over the place so so desert fishes it's kind of a kind of almost like an oxymoron this is kind of maybe in more of an e ecology type question but how do fish end up in in the desert that's a great question yeah the last thing people think of when they think of the deserts are fish not only living but thriving in those habitats but there are quite a few fishes in the desert if you look at the u.s in particular a lot of our western fishes in the arid lands are in a lot bigger trouble as well than their eastern counterparts but the way the fishes ended up there if you look back about 100 at a, it was at its peak at about 100 to 110 million years ago uh, most of the central U.S. was covered by what was called the Cretaceous Seaway. It was a tropical, probably coral-filled sea full of plesiosaurs and mosasaurs uh, and fishes. So most of what we think of now as desert is Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada. A lot of that was covered by a very shallow, warm ocean 110 million years ago. Uh, it started to recede as the continents moved around and ice ages ended and the, the climate started changing. It's now into what we call the Gulf of Mexico. As a result, you had all these little pockets of water left over in this dry land that were coming from springs and natural aquifers. And each of these pockets ended up getting deposited some fish. I mean, these are mostly uh, mostly the pupfishes, uh, the gadeids, the killifishes, the live bears, are, are filled a lot of these small springs. They probably were all the same species when the water receded, but over time they evolved and they diversified into kind of a menagerie of very, very small habitats containing unique species of fish. It's an absolutely fascinating process. Well, we are definitely going to delve into that a little bit more, but first, let's take a short break and we'll continue our, our discussion of desert fishes with my guest, Barrett Christie, after these messages from our sponsors. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations and treat bowls, cups and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash pet life. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. dot com. <laughs>
We're back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Barrett Christie, Director of Animal Husbandry at the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk. So, um, Barrett, you were kind of giving us a little bit of the uh, history of desert fishes yeah. in uh, the Southwest. So, as you mentioned, probably coming from the same maybe species, you know, millions of years ago, what kind of biology commonalities do they have because of the uh, desert habitat? And maybe then we'll talk about some differences after. Yeah, there's quite a few similarities and and quite a few differences, as you would expect. Most of the smaller groups that we're working with, or most of the smaller fishes we're working with in aquariums and that a lot of hobbyists and dedicated individuals have at home tend to be the little diminutive fishes, the pup fishes, the gadeids, the live bears. Now, that being said, there's quite a diversity of fish in the deserts of North America. We have four deserts, uh, the Sonoran, the uh, Chihuahuan, the Mojave and the uh, the Great Basin. Four different deserts, four different climates, different levels of precipitation and plant fauna and everything else. So we have a wide variety, about 165 species total, which includes some larger species, some minnows, some salmons, salmonids. There's, there's quite a few, about six species of endangered salmonid in the American West. So the diversity in terms of taxonomy is huge there. There's a lot of different types of fish. For the ones that we tend to focus on in aquariums and, and keep in aquariums, there are some, some similarities. These guys all come from usually springs or small spring-fed rivers because that's often the only source of water in the desert. So they tend to like very, very hard water sometimes a little bit on the cooler side because they are from springs. Most of them are omnivores. They eat a lot of insects, but also plant material. So there's quite a few similarities there in their biology and their behavior. They're also, most of them, uh, most of the pupfishes tend to be fiercely territorial, which is actually how they got the name pupfish. It was thought that they looked, the males looked like a puppy chasing each other around because the males can be fiercely territorial and beat up on not only each other, but also on the females once they've finished breeding. So that's kind of how they got the name. The Gadeids are a little bit more peaceful. Uh, they tend to behave very much like the live bears. They do well in large groups. They're not very territorial. They cohabitate very nicely, are generally a peaceful fish. And they're also, the Gadeids are also live bears like the Pasilids. So we're going to talk now a little bit about maybe some of the issues with, with the desert fishes, so, which, um, and there may be a lot of them, so maybe you, you may want to just talk about some of the more important ones, but which desert fishes are listed as threatened or endangered and why? Sadly, quite a few. There's 10 counties in the western U.S. that have more than five endemic endangered fish species. There's over 40 counties that have three plus endangered endemic fishes. Yeah, it's the highest rate of endangered fish species anywhere in the country, despite the fact that diversity is a lot lower than, say, the southeast. So there are quite a few endangered. There's over 60 endangered species, threatened or endangered, uh, listed at the federal level or at the state level. And there's probably even more than that south of the border in Mexico that we don't have a great sense on. They don't have the same protections in many sense south of the border that they have in the U.S. So there's quite a few species there that we just don't know about. They may be in trouble. There's quite a few that aquariums have rescued and have propagated in order to keep them alive as a living ark because we knew they were going extinct and their habitat was being destroyed. But there's a huge number out there. Probably the poster child for endangered desert fishes is the devil's hole pupfish. If you Google devil's hole pupfish, you'll find out a lot about this. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing a fantastic job trying to keep these alive. Uh, and they were actually, oddly enough, these guys were the center of the first Supreme Court case to challenge the Endangered Species Act back in the 1970s. Like I said, a lot of these are spring-dwelling fishes. They live in groundwater. So when we pump out huge amounts of groundwater to have agriculture in places where agriculture doesn't normally exist like the West, we end up driving the water level down in those springs and destroying their habitat. So this was actually, like I said, the Devil's Hole pupfish in particular that U.S. Fish and Wildlife manages. They were uh, the first test case, the first real challenge to the Endangered Species Act because the mining companies wanted to continue to pump the groundwater out, which would have driven them extinct. And this is a species biologically that's very, very remarkable. It's, it's certainly a unique animal. They have the smallest natural range of any vertebrate on the planet. They occur in a, an area less than 150 square meters. And their population size is the smallest of any vertebrate on the planet. For the devil's hole pupfish in particular, their average population fluctuates between 120 and 300 some odd individuals every year. And some years has gotten down as low as 30. These are numbers to a geneticist that are just unheard of. You know, no other vertebrate species has populations that low and can still maintain genetic diversity and thrive. So with all that said, how many are in captivity, I guess, relative to that number in the wild? There's quite a few. So there's about, there's 600 some odd species found in all the deserts. 
Uh, of those, there's about 60, 70 that are in trouble. And I would say of those, we probably have about 30 species in captivity. We focus on a small handful of Mexican species within the AZA programs because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service focuses on all of the species that occur within the U.S. border. Uh, we tend to focus on the Mexican species because they don't have the same protections that the U.S. species have. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in particular runs an amazing hatchery called the Dexter National Fish Hatchery, where they breed 15 to 20 endangered or extinct in the wild fishes from within the U.S. We tend to focus on some of these species that don't get as much love south of the border, but we're in real, real trouble. So there's probably 20 or 30 in captivity. A good way to get involved would be to go to any American Killifish Association meeting or local killifish club, because you tend to see a lot of these guys, especially the pupfishes and goodeads, occasionally pop up in auctions. Uh, and many of these animals are critically endangered or they're extinct in the wild. And they are really uh, keeping them alive is is really forming like a an arc for these species. And if on the off chance their habitat ever is restored in the wild, we still have the genetics. We still have the species to put back. So uh, thanks for uh, explaining all that, Barrett. Are you seeing any positive results from your and AZA's efforts to date? You know, when you're whenever you're working with endangered species, it's... It can be disheartening at times because you're you're dealing with these animals and oftentimes there is no return to the wild for them. Their habitats have already been destroyed and they're gone. Uh, with a lot of these species that we have that AZA institutions and other aquariums and zoos are maintaining in captive care, we actually could have. There's a light at the end of the tunnel for these animals. So we haven't seen any restoration efforts yet on a large scale. But we have these animals as a living ark. We have the genetics and the populations alive in captivity so that if any of these habitats are ever restored, if there's a political sea change tomorrow and we stop removing as much groundwater from the deserts and the arid lands of the American and the Mexican Wests, we actually have the animals to put back and we, we can start to, we'll never reclaim that habitat that was there in all of its glory, but we, we will be able to put some of these species back uh, and partially restore that habitat. I actually had a quick question referring to something you had mentioned earlier. Because the numbers can get so low, down to 30 for some of the uh, populations, Yes, is there a pretty good explanation why the, there is no major genetic issues you know, or um, bottlenecking, anything like that? That's a great question. The best way I've ever heard it described to me by an actual pupfish geneticist is that these animals, we don't so much have to worry about the bottleneck because they already went through the bottleneck 250 to 500,000 years ago. These animals have persisted despite their very, very small population sizes in these small springs and in these small rivers. Basically, they're inbred, but that inbreeding can create a number of problems. There were probably many, many more species that went extinct in geological time because of that. But the pupfishes, for whatever reason, have been able to survive despite this inbreeding and actually able to have sufficient genetic diversity from these combinations to keep their populations alive. It's, it's really kind of a paradox. Uh, geneticists don't typically think of viable populations of, of species being 20, 30 animals, 100 animals. Normally, they're looking for at least several hundred, if not several thousand. Uh, one interesting case study, we had a species alive in Dallas. It was a, a type of pupfish, and the scientific name was Megupsilonoporus, that a, a very talented aquarist, Charles Yancey, uh, and Dr. Paul Wazell from the New York Aquarium, went down and rescued from Mexico in the early 1990s. Uh, they collected the last two of these animals that were ever recorded in the wild before their habitat disappeared. So we had a founding population of one male, one female. Uh, and Charles was actually able to breed these at the Dallas Aquarium for almost 30 generations. They have very short lifespans and keep the population viable. Unfortunately, the numbers did go down and down and down because you obviously want a larger founder population to start with. But we actually ended up with those animals with a, a generation of two males. And we thought all was lost. The species is going to go extinct. They're extinct in the wild and we have the last remaining population. But we work with some researchers at UC Berkeley and we were actually able to take those animals and hybridize them with another pupfish species and back cross it, you know, much the way the, the Florida panther was saved back in the 90s uh, in your home state. And we were able to save the genome, if not the species. So at least we have the genetics of this fascinating, unique animal. That's cool. So there are definitely ways to kind of try to salvage some of it, as you mentioned. So right. on the um, kind of hobbyist side, there is a group called NANFA, and 
I know yes. they're involved with some uh, native fishes as well. Maybe can you uh, tell us a little bit about NANFA and, and your association or any work you've done with them or through them? Yeah, I've been a member of NANFA for years, and I think it's great for hobbyists. Uh, I recently became the regional representative for the state of Connecticut for NANFA. But the, the Native Fishes Association is a great group of really dedicated people. A lot of these guys, they have an online discussion forum. It's all centered around, you know, American native species. So a lot of your pretty little freshwater fish that often get overlooked. You know, I find it really interesting. These guys are, are dedicated to keeping them at home and, and breeding them and advancing the husbandry of all these pretty little darters and shiners and all these cool fish that so often get overlooked. Working in public aquariums, one of the things I find really interesting to me uh, is that we oftentimes go to great lengths to recreate these habitats from the Amazon or the Congo, Southeast Asia when we're looking at freshwater tanks, or if it's a reef tank, you know, Indo-Pacific, Fiji. We go to great lengths to bring these exotic animals to our guests, and we kind of ignore what's in our own backyards. When I go overseas and I go to aquariums in Europe and the like, you know, they have American fish species, darters and shiners and Florida flag fish and all kinds of really cool stuff that to them is very exotic. But to us, it's kind of, oh, oh you know, I've got gar in my backyard. It's not as big of a deal to us, but I think we overlook our native fish species. We have a huge diversity, especially in the southeastern United States. And I think it'd be a really cool thing to see more of that in public aquariums because often it gets overlooked for the flashier, shinier Amazon, African, Southeast Asian species. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, and kind of uh, as a side note, we're actually working on some uh, um, native fish reproduction here because of the, as you mentioned, the great interest in Europe and, and non US areas. So yeah, definitely. So I guess uh, tagging along that question, do you believe hobbyists can play a role in conservation of native fishes and why? And maybe which species would that be helpful for? Absolutely, I do. One of our colleagues, Dr. Paul Wazell down at the New York Aquarium, has said many times that the best thing an endangered fish can do to ensure its survival is to attract the attention of the hobby. Because if you look at so many fish species, there are many that we see in pet shops every day that we don't even think of as being extinct in the wild. You know, white cloud minnows, for example, are extinct in the wild. Bosmani rainbow fish from Madagascar are an endangered, if not critically endangered species. So there's a lot of these that have been propagated and we've saved that species. The genome is out there in the hobby because they're an attractive fish species. So a little bit further kind of to drill down in that question, if somebody were interested in really making a difference for conservation, I think there's absolutely a role for dedicated fish keepers to play. One of the first things I would point them towards is joining the American Killifish Association or their local killie club. That's where a lot of these fish species tend to pop up. You know, they pop up on the auction table. They're being maintained in tanks under human care. And not only are they being maintained, but they're being maintained in a very scientific, fastidious way where we're maintaining the genetics of certain populations and they track these guys. So there's a, a phenomenal interest out there if you can get connected with it. There's a lot of very dedicated hobbies keeping these fishes. Some examples of some that people could keep at home that might make a difference to conservation would be, you know, certainly the Gadeids. Uh, there's quite a few of those out there in the hobby. Amica splendens, the butterfly split fin, is one that we manage in AZA institutions. Uh, it's one that's a little bit more commonly out there. This is an animal that's extinct in the wild um, that you can breed at home, that you can find them all the time in, in the killifish circles. There's a number of cichlids as well. There's the haplochromis cichlids from Lake Victoria. Still quite a few of those out there in the hobby that are being maintained, uh, especially in Europe, but also here in the U.S. There's paratroplus cichlids from, uh, they get a lot bigger, so they need a bigger bigger tank. Uh, but the paratroplus from Madagascar, another animal, many of those species are in quite a bit of trouble, uh, and they can also be maintained at home. And, and speaking of Madagascar, I mean, once you start getting into there, that's an island that's really got a lot of unique fish species, and many of them are in trouble. And many of the little killifishes from Madagascar are strikingly beautiful. A lot of the pachypanchaks uh, and a lot of those other genera and species of fish are absolutely gorgeous and fairly easy to care for at home. So there's a number of avenues you could take. You know, on the saltwater side, even things as simple as breeding Bangai cardinal fish. You know, the Bangai cardinal fish was the sensation of the 1990s and early 2000s. We rediscovered this species and almost drove it to extinction within 10 years. Now people are starting to breed those and supply the demand in the hobby with tank-raised fish so that we're not having to take those from the wild. There's a number of avenues that I feel that anybody with the dedication and the time to put into it really can make a difference in conservation. So I guess there's a couple kind of parts to that. One is folks can be involved with sort of helping with maybe demand by breeding fish that they have some problems potentially in the wild. And for those that are kind of interested in maybe trying to 
help with conservation efforts directly in terms of you know, maybe for restocking or that sort of thing. Is there kind of an avenue for that with AZA or is it kind of still a little bit more? Not so much uh, with AZA, but there are groups out there. If you Google Gudead Working Group or Cyprenodon Working Group, uh, a lot of these guys are academics. A lot of them are researchers at universities. But a lot of these guys are just really dedicated home hobbyists that are tracking the endangered fishes that they're breeding at home. And they're keeping very detailed notes and they're keeping track of their populations and providing annual census data to these. So those are definitely two avenues for those that are interested would be to try and reach out to the, the Cyprenodon Working Group or the Gadead Working Group uh, and see if you can get involved. And you can usually... Uh, like I said, those are two organizations that are very heavily integrated within the American Killifish Association. So especially with these species that we're talking about, pupfish and, and gadeids, the clearest avenue into working with those animals is really getting involved with the killie fanatics. That's great. Great advice. So uh, as we come to the close of this great interview, I, I'm going to ask you, I, and you kind of gave some suggestions at the beginning, but for a potential future budding Aquarius with all the competition out there, do you have any advice for how some of these people may eventually get a job at a public aquarium? Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely the greatest job in the world. I tell my staff all the time that we have the coolest jobs in the world, and I don't think anybody takes it for granted. The competition, like I said, can be fierce. There's a lot of people that want these jobs. First and foremost, I would really make sure you're you're willing to take the vow of poverty that comes with being a professional animal keeper because they are not well-paying jobs but they are jobs you will love every single day of your life. But the best way to do it, like I mentioned previously, is, is to gain experience however you can. The great paradox in trying to work at a public aquarium is that you can't get your foot in the door until you get experience, but you can't get experience until you get your foot in the door. So doing an internship or volunteering at as many different places as you can, even if you only volunteer a few hours a week, that really helps you build the knowledge and build the connections that you'll need to kind of demonstrate that you might be a good fit for these candidates. And again, like I said, just it pays to be persistent. It pays to not get discouraged if you get told no 14, 15, 20 times because on that 21st interview, you may get the job and it may be the start of a fantastic career. So I guess a follow-up question, do you have any suggestions with regard to like education and you know things like that? Certainly, I think in our, our industry, the Bachelors of Science has kind of become the standard minimum. You really need a, a degree from a university to pursue this field. There actually is another great avenue out there for anybody that really wants to work in public aquariums. You can do a two-year Associates of Applied Science at Oregon Coast Community College. They actually have an aquarium science program set up. Or if you have a bachelor's degree already in one of the natural sciences, you can do a one-year certificate program, which is going to teach you the hands-on skills you need to be an aquarist in a public aquarium. I started getting involved with them this year, went out and visited the school, did some mock interviews with the students and kind of evaluated the program. And it's absolutely phenomenal. So if you're really serious about it, I would definitely look at the, the Oregon Coast Community College Aquarium Science Program. But certainly education wise, at the very least, you need to have some college experience, even if it's an associate. Sometimes that can be offset. Uh, if you have a two year degree, you can offset that with a lot of hobbyist experience. I certainly don't limit myself to candidates that don't have a bachelor's degree, but you need to have some kind of formal education for most aquariums to get that first entry level job. Well, thank you for that. Definitely great advice. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I, I know I could talk to you for a long time, Barrett, and I'm sure I'll uh, set up some additional interviews on some of your other areas of expertise. <laughs> so uh, thanks very much. I want to thank our guest, Barrett Christie, and our producer, Mark Winter, for making this show possible. So, Barrett, did you have any final words of wisdom or information that you wanted to impart to our listeners? I would say the one thing I would tell any fish keeper, whether you want to get into a public aquarium or, or just be more successful in your home fish room, is never pass up the opportunity to learn a new skill. Whether it's plumbing or electrical or welding, veterinary skills, you never know when it's going to come in handy. Never pass up that opportunity to learn a new skill, no matter how unrelated it seems. Well, that's great advice. And actually, that's probably great advice for life, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Well, thanks again for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Please be sure to check out Barrett's web links. And uh, Barrett, I'll get as many links as you think are appropriate and uh, maybe helpful for others. And uh, we'll put those on your Aquarium Mania guest page. Great. I encourage all of you to visit my Aquarium Mania blog on Pet Life Radio. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy at PetLifeRadio.com. That's D-R-R-O-Y at PetLifeRadio.com. 
Until next time, please be sure to keep your local aquarium stores happy with visits, keep your tanks clean and your fish healthy, and keep an eye out for updates on the status of desert fishes and get involved if you can. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.